Good morning, church.
Good morning. Welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Michael. I'm very happy to see you here on, I don't care what the calendar says, today feels like fall to me. So I don't know when the first day it technically is, but yeah, that, no. No, last Thursday it was still like 80, wasn't it? Anywho, um, we're obviously glad that you could join us today. Do we have any announcements over yonder? Push. There you go. Uh, so Monday at 10 o'clock, we're going to be studying Romans, a new, uh, new study. And then, okay, it's that time of the year where I'm going to bug you guys to death because it's going to be tricks and treats. It's coming. October is coming. It's going to be October 22nd from 4 until 6. We're planning on it being outside. If it's icky. We can always move inside. We're fortunate enough to have the um, fellowship hall. So there's a sign-up sheet on the board as you go into the fellowship hall. So you can just put your little signature on it about what you'd like to do. Um, the biggest thing is the games. We always are a little short. Rob Hudspeth's going to be here doing balloons for the kids. Mr. Balloon Man. So anyway. Um, Does he know how to do like pumpkins and stuff? Um, no, I haven't seen him do pumpkins. Elephants, I think giraffes. Different. I was like thinking fall. Yeah, kind no. Of things. Well, no. Mm -mm. Okay. no. We'll have to call him and tell him to start practicing. Uh, no. No, I'm just happy to get him. I have to book him way out. <laughs> so, so anyway, I won't bug you too hard until another week or so. Then, watch out. But that's all. All right. Anybody else got anything? I'm probably forgetting something, so I may tell you something later, but I think we're good. So I'm going to turn things over to our praise band, who's going to get us started on our worship service this morning. Please turn your hearts and minds to a time of worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And good morning, everyone. If you could find a red folder near you in the pew and stand with us if you are able. Otherwise, go ahead and sing in place where you are. We're going to start with number 11 in the red folder. He has made me glad, and we will sing this twice, and then we will be seated for our second song. This is number 11. He has made me glad. Yes, 
I'm Dave, the liturgist for today. If able, will you please stand for our opening prayer? Eternal God, help us to measure our time in faithful generosity that your will be done, your kingdom come for life everlasting. In Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. You may be, oops, you may be seated. We brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of the world. Let us give both the gifts that we have been given and our trust, or I'm sorry, our truest selves with glad and generous hearts. Please rise and join in singing our doxology. God who gives life to all things and richly provides us with everything, use these, our offerings, to take hold of and show us the life that really is. Amen. It is now, uh, you can all be seated, it is now a time for all of God's children, so if some of God's children would want to come hang out with me, um, and just remember you're all God's children, so... You don't have to be a certain age or height. Oh, wow, you got a bear. There's another one of God's children. Okay. Okay, I, I need this arm, okay? Okay, hold on. All right, so, do you guys remember what, um, what you're learning about this month?
Remember, you're learning about God calling people to do stuff. Remember, we, last week we talked about um, Solomon and, or no, I'm sorry, Samuel and Saul. So we're going to keep talking about people who, get, who are called by God. Can you guys think of any brothers in the Bible? Do you guys know any of the brothers who are in the Bible? No. Well, let's see. There's Cain and Abel. They, they, they didn't have a good time. That's not a good example of a brotherly relationship. Um, Jacob and Esau. That was rough, but they got through it. Uh, Moses and Aaron. Uh, Aaron was Moses' like right hand, so they had a very special relationship. Peter and Andrew, James and John, okay. and then do you guys, I'm trying to think if you would know this or not, maybe not. There's a story in the Bible about Joseph and his brothers, and he has a bunch of brothers, and they end up not getting along at first. But you guys will probably learn about that later in the year, so. All right, there is another family of brothers that we're gonna learn about today, and that is David and his brothers. There are a lot of brothers in the Bible, aren't there? All right, so Samuel anoints David. So that's David, and that's Samuel. Okay. Saul disobeyed God, so God decided to choose a new king from Jesse's sons. God sent Samuel to find the new king. Samuel met Jesse's sons. Samuel thought the oldest, here we go again, Elib looked like the next king. But God told Samuel, do not look at his looks. He is not the new king. Humans see only the outside. I look into the hearts and spirits of people. Jesse presented each of his sons, but God said no to all of them. Are these all of your sons, Samuel asked Jesse? The youngest is out tending the sheep. Please send for him, said Samuel. The youngest son, David, came in from the sheep. God said, that is the one. Samuel took the oil and and anointed David to be the next king. I wonder, what what would make a good king? Yeah. Uh, Like a a person that's kind of like a kind king. That's the one that should be king. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody who's kind. No oh, evil. No evil, okay. Um, talk to them. Someone who's, who's good at communicating and talking, absolutely, yeah. Helping them. Someone who helps people, yeah, that's very good. I like a king that says, give me, give me money right now. It's not a bad king. So, bad king. so not a, someone who's not greedy, yeah. A good king is someone who, who cares about their people and who, who listens to their advisors who can, can help them because the job of a king is very difficult and be very demanding. So, we're gonna do a short repeat after me prayer. If you can fold your hands. Dear God, Thank you for teaching us that everyone can be called by you. Amen. Okay, and then I need your help with one more thing. I bet you'll never guess what it is. That's right, the Lord's Prayer. You said you can never guess it, but we did. I know. All right, you guys ready? ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming to hang out. Go over to Sunday school. Remember walking feet. At least we know that they heard us. All right. Um, If you would rise as you are able for our next hymn, number 66, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. be seated. Now is the time that we lift before God and God's people the things that may weigh upon our hearts and our minds, but also those that give us cause for celebration and thanksgiving. Do we have any joys or concerns we'd like to lift up this morning? Well, this family of mine just seems to have a lot of problems. He's there another son of my uh, sister that uh, passed away. Mark was her second born. Um, He had pains in his chest and that, and he ended up last Friday, I think it was Friday, with triple bypass in um, St. Fort Pierce, Florida. Uh, He's doing okay right now, but he's still in the hospital, so let's pray for Mark. Right after my sister passed away in 2019, Mark's wife passed away that September uh, with lung cancer. So he's had a lot of burdens with him. So pray for Mark. Um, Our sister-in-law, Robin Zufall, has been diagnosed with cancer. Um, She had some uterine cancer and had the surgery and apparently there were stray cells that got out so now it's in her abdomen. So she's struggling right now. So prayers for her healing and peace.
Today is Dorothy Newman's birthday, so when you see her, be sure to wish her a happy birthday. Well, along with the other um, heart concerns, I have a short update on Rob Hutzbeth, but it's a good update. As you may recall, he has a long-standing history of a very special heart condition where the nervous system doesn't have the appropriate feedback for the electrical conductivity of his heart to keep him standing and not passing out. So he knows he has issues, but recently he had some concerning symptoms. He went in, had a battery of tests, and he was all set for a number of interventions this past week that I told you about last Sunday. And we've been praying, and this is good because the heart catheterization, when they went in, they found no blockage. They found nothing wrong with his heart. His heart is fine. It's the underlying interesting condition. So he's going to be monitored carefully. They will check his blood pressure meds. But when you see him in October for our Halloween gathering, be sure to give him a lot of grief and tell him that he has left us very confused. But we praise God. Has he consulted an electrician? Maybe get some rewiring done? I ran into Rob Friday. He says the pipes are fine. It's all electrical. So yeah, so not a plumber. I think he needs an electrician. Get some. That's what he told me. Those were his words. Do we have any others? OK, so a lot of you know my mother-in-law was not well. Last Monday, she got moved to hospice because she was in way too much pain up at Mission Point. They put her in hospice on Monday. She passed on Wednesday. Yesterday was the service. It was lovely. Um, I did not realize till after the service that she was actually there. She was covered with her picture standing on top of her. I didn't realize that was her ashes, but she was there. And we know she was there because pictures kept falling down. <laughs> she had said she was going to haunt us all. <laughs> she was knocking pictures off the boards. Um, my mom is unfortunately still up at St. Joe. It was supposed to be three days. It's now been a week and a half. They've told me they are discharging her tomorrow. The question is, where is she supposed to go? So wish me luck on that. All right, if you would please join me in an attitude of prayer. Lord, we call to you our refuge Provide your safe space. We know that war continues around the globe, and we pray for safety and refuge for the innocent and those affected by the decisions of the few. We call to you our fortress. Provide your strength. God, we ask that you would walk alongside those who are in need of healing. We lift up Mark and Robin and Rob, as well as all unspoken health concerns and issues that we carry with us. We call to you our trust, provide your vision. God help us to see your love and grace in this world. We call to you our deliverer, provide your promise. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit with all of those who are in mourning this day. We pray that they know that there is no right way to mourn. We all do it in our own time, in our own ways. We just pray for comfort and peace as they go through their mourning. We call to you our cover, provide your gentleness. We call to you our faithful, provide your presence. We call to you our shield, provide your defense. We call to you our bunker, provide our confidence. We call to you our protector, provide your future. We give you thanks 
for the opportunity to celebrate birthdays with our loved ones, especially we lift up Dorothy as she celebrates a birthday. And we pray that there will be many more to come. We call to you our rescuer, provide your breath. We call to you our satisfaction, provide your peace. We call to you our savior, provide your grace, amen. And if you would please turn to page 70 in your hymnals for our response to prayer, glory be to the Father. please join me aloud in our prayer for illumination. God of the prophets, by the power of the Holy Spirit, speak your word to us and seal it within us that we may heed your call. Amen. Our first scripture reading for today is from Psalms. It's Psalm 91, 1 through 6, and 14 through 16. It can be found in the Pew Bibles on page 589 and 590. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rapport. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for that he acknowledges my name. He will call on my and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. For with all life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The word of the God for the people of God. God. If you're able, would you please stand for our next hymn, Fear Us, Lord Jesus. Page 189 in the hymnal.
You may be seated. All right, our second scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 19, which you can find on page 1177 in the Bibles and the pews. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Jesus Christ, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time, God the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you would please join me again in an attitude of prayer. God of joy and blessing, we ask for your intervention in our hearts and minds. Help us to find happiness and contentedness in our lives and not let the pressures of our world push us away from gratitude of the good things in our lives. Help us to also see one another so that when someone is in need, we can joyfully give to them from our abundance along with a love and grace inspired by the life of your Son, our Savior. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning again to you all, and may you always know the love and grace of God in your life. This morning we're going to be closing out our September sermon series titled Reboot, where we've been talking about how it's never too late in our lives for renewal and reconciliation. And as I've tried to point out each week, this is especially true when it comes to our faith and our relationship with God. So far, we have reconciled relationships, we have reimagined regret, and we have reframed prayer using Paul's letter to Philemon and Paul's first letter to Timothy. Last week when we were reframing prayer, we were looking at Paul's instruction to pray for everyone, even the people that we may not like very much or who we see as our adversary. Paul reminds the readers that Jesus came to save the whole world and therefore we should be praying 
for the whole world. And we talked about how when we do that, when we pray for the whole world, our hearts are realigned into the image of God and we begin to love like Jesus loves. We also talked for a few moments about the challenges that some of us may have with prayer, feeling like maybe we don't know how to pray or how to pray correctly or that maybe we just don't feel like we do it often enough and have a feeling of guilt. I promise, though, I will address some of that in a future message. But today we're going to jump back, or jump ahead a few chapters into Paul's first letter to Timothy, to chapter 6, verses 6 through 19, that I just read for you moments ago. And as the sermon title in the bulletin indicates, we are going to try to rethink happiness. The church, the church, there we go, has changed in many ways over the years, and, and not just this congregation, but the church in the bigger sense. And sometimes those changes have been for better or for worse, depending on your point of view, your beliefs, your experience, and, and other factors that come through life. And while the mission of the church to share the good news hasn't really changed much over time, although its delivery has. But several other things have changed. The style of music, for one. Early church, I guarantee you the musical stylings would be very foreign to us today. And I don't even begin to imagine what the music will sound like hundreds of years from now. Just hope there is still music. The primary language spoken has changed. The theology has definitely changed over the time. The design style of the worship space has changed over time. The liturgy, of course, has changed over time. Again, all these things and many more Again, for better or for worse, depending on each person, each group, each community, and so on. One thing that seems to be true, or I think rather clear, is that the church has lost a great deal of its authority when it comes to talking about money. Before everybody panics, this is not a stewardship message. But that, that loss of authority, I think it's primarily due to parishioners' exhaustion with sermons about stewardship, traveling evangelists with personal jets, the current financial struggles of many in our congregations, and really the lack of noticeable distinction between the materialism of God's chosen in the rest of the world. It's really no wonder why many pastors will, will shy away from tackling anything that might resemble a stewardship talk outside of an annual campaign. I can tell you very honestly that I may tend to shy away from such discussions or focuses for sermons, mostly because of the challenge of making sure the message is heard with its truest intentions. I have heard my fair share of such sermons, and sometimes they come off as manipulative or guilt trips, out of touch, some even just as a simple money grab. And, and please understand that I'm not saying this is always true, but depending on the people sitting in the pews and their own financial situations or struggles, stewardship messages can be delivered in ways that are offensive, hurtful, guilt-ridden, and even really depressing. The divide of the haves 
and have nots in our country and really in our world continues to grow. The average person has less disposable income. The cost of medications and insurance continues to soar. And I can tell you that most people my age and younger have, have little hope of affording the purchase of a home or paying off our student loan debts before we die. When I look through the lens of that reality, it feels really hypocritical to ask others to give more out of the less that they may have. But I will also say that by not talking about stewardship at all, we may not be doing ourselves any favors either. Generations before mine were, were told that you should never talk about politics or religion at the dinner table. And all that's gotten us is several generations of people who don't know how to have a civil and constructive discussion about either of those things in any context, not just at a meal. The same may be true, or at least has the potential to become true, when we think about stewardship in the church. This passage from chapter 6 of Paul's letter to Timothy is, is something of a direct and really powerful example that I think offers pastors and, and laity a chance to confront one of the chief spiritual struggles of our day and do so without handing out a pledge card. In this passage, Paul tackles the dangers of materialism, but he doesn't do that to induce feelings of guilt or shame among the wealthy because he's not writing to the wealthy in this letter. And he's not trying to raise money for his cause or some large, expensive project either. Instead, one way that I hope we can look at Paul here through his words is as a pastor at work, one speaking honestly with another partner in ministry, Timothy, about his fears for his people. And the truth is that many, if not all, pastors do this still today. We may not write to a colleague as much as speak to them about our fears for our congregations, our people, but I promise you conversations just like this are happening all the time even happen across denominations sometimes. We don't assume that what worked in one congregation will always work in another. We're not necessarily looking for the, the cookie-cutter 12-step program, but we are looking at where God is active so that we can maybe better understand where and how God is active in our own context. Part of what is at issue here is contentment or the power of being at peace with what we have and who we are. Let's be honest here. A lot of our society's messaging pushes us to always grab for more, to push and push and fight for more and more. The concept of contentment is, is often foreign for many people because it flies in the face of so much of what we are taught, what we experience, and what we are constantly being told by advertising and political messaging. One of the most devastating ways that sin manifests itself in our lives is through the desperate attempt to address spiritual hunger with a material object. It's also one of the easiest to fall victim to as we are we're constantly bombarded from morning to night with solutions to problems that we never knew we even had. 
advertising agencies specialize in helping us discover that thing that we need that we didn't even know existed. The number of ridiculous products that you can buy after watching some of just the worst directed and acted commercials ever, which I will admit is a guilty pleasure of mine watching. But that has just given rise to to just several people how this how parody that this reality by creating what they call unnecessary inventions and advertise them on things like social media and television. They're intended to point out the ridiculousness of TV shopping. There's a gentleman who has created some very humorous unnecessary inventions. Ironically, though, a few of his have actually become their own commercial successes. Here in the United States, we have a thriving self-storage industry dedicated to all our extra stuff, objects that no longer need an immediate, or no longer meet an immediate need, but that we hold on to just in case. Because you never know when that day will come when you will need that extra Tupperware cover for a container that you no longer have. And I am speaking from personal experience. I own that. It can be so ridiculous that we have, a, we have television shows of people buying storage lockers and rummaging through the things that they find but it's also tragic. You know, interestingly, according to many experts, fights about money remain the number one cause of marital, marital strife. And we live in one of the most prosperous ages in human history. And the desire to have more has really never been more powerful. Is it really under any wonder that God or the gospel commands against materialism still seems to fall on deaf ears? Is it really any wonder, especially when we take a step back and, and realize that it is because it is also a word of confrontation? When we think about it that way, may not be quite as surprising in the end. Confrontation is it's a bad word for many of us. Most of us don't like it. Some people do. Some people thrive on it. Some people find entertainment in it. But I think for a lot of us, confrontation is uncomfortable. Confrontation tends to carry anger, resentment, heartbreak, and a myriad of other unpleasant feelings that can leave us drained and feeling broken. But there is another truth here. There is also a word of hope. And it is a word of hope for all of us, even those of us with self-storage units. The text of this passage asks the readers, both back then and still now us today, some challenging questions about where we place our hope. And again, it doesn't do this to condemn those in a certain income bracket, but it asks those questions to help liberate all of us who have become shackled by our stuff. I think it would be fair to assume that Paul and Timothy both would be taken aback by the wealth of most North American Christians. But it's also important to point out that materialism has a way of numbing us to what we already have. How telling is it that 
most of us think of the wealthy as anyone who has more than we currently do. The need for more can, can only breed perpetual discontent with what you have and, and creates a persistent focus on what's parked in your neighbor's driveway. Louis C.K., who has become a controversial figure, but a, a comedian nonetheless, he had a, a television show a few years back, and in an episode of the show, he's speaking to his character's daughter after she expresses her unhappiness about what she believes to be an unfair distribution of popsicles between herself and her sister. And in a moment of sincerity and powerful seriousness, especially in a comedy show, Lewis gives her this wisdom, this parental piece of nurturing to her. He tells her the only time you look in your neighbor's bowl is to make sure that they have enough. You don't look in your neighbor's bowl to see if you have as much as them. And when we are open and honest with these words of Paul's, I think we can finally then begin to experience some healing. But we can't experience that healing if we are unwilling to let Paul deliver the diagnosis. And you know, while, while we don't lift it up as a virtue as often as we probably should, we all notice when we encounter someone who is content. Usually because we're so unused to having that feeling ourselves or seeing it in others, it tends to stand out. How many times have we heard a, a missionary or someone who has returned from a mission trip to an impoverished place in this world often take up that familiar refrain that they had so little but seemed so happy. What this often results in for many is an unsatisfying sense of guilt that the wealthier participant should always be happy with what they have no matter anything else present in their reality or context. But at heart, it's really an invitation to see happiness in a completely different way. Not that some of us, or not that someone can be happy with less, necessarily, but what you have has little to no bearing on happiness at all. That is now to discount how financial struggles can, can pile on feelings of unhappiness when, when we can't put food on the table, can't afford medications we need, can't provide the things to those that we love that we feel we should be able to provide. That absolutely can affect our happiness. Feeling like we're failing in our lives, whether as parents, children, siblings, friends, that can have an impact on our happiness. So I don't want you to misunderstand my earlier statement But perhaps Paul's words here can help us in, in what might be the most challenging reboot of all. 
learning holy satisfaction or the practice of relentless gratitude coupled with faith in the provider. It is important, and this is something that we talk about fairly often, it is something that we have a national holiday dedicated to, in theory, but being thankful, showing gratitude, not only to our loved ones, but to God, and remembering that we can find true and joyful happiness in those moments. Amen. If you would rise as you are able for our closing hymn number 581, Lord, whose love through humble service. Beloved siblings in Christ Jesus, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Take hold of the life that really is. And now leave in jubilee knowing somewhere in an earthen jar is the deed to the land of the Lord, a land of houses and fields and vineyards, a land of redemption, a land that shall be bought again. Go in peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.